Nate Henning and Andrew Manford from UC Berkeley. Nate Henning is a PhD student in Dan Nomura's group at Berkeley, and his research focuses on TPD and additional induced proximity platforms such as the, the ubiquitinase targeting chimeras or dot tags by especially utilizing covalent ligand discovery approach. Prior to joining Dan Nomura's lab, he worked as a research tech in Nathaniel Grace lab at Dana Harbor here. So Nate, I'm so glad to see your amazing achievement there. And Andrew Manberg is a superstar postdoctoral fellow with Mikhail Rappe at Berkeley. Andrew's work in Rappe's group focuses on identifying and characterizing new roles for ubiquitin ligases in regulating cellular differentiation and metabolism. His research has led to the discovery of the re uh, reductive stress response, a pathway that controls mitochondrial activity and redox homeostasis through the ubiquitin ligase called 2 femon b And Mikhail Rappe represented Andrew's seminar work in our webinar series last year, so you can check it out in our YouTube. So Nate, Andrew, thank you very much for accepting our invitation and very much looking forward to your seminar. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Hojong. That's a really kind introduction. Um, and we're both uh, really excited to be uh, to be here today to have the opportunity to present. The seminar series has been a really great resource for everybody, and I'm so glad that it just keeps going. Um, so um, uh, it's and like like Hojong said, I worked for a little bit uh, in at Dana Farber in the Gray's lab, and so it's. Uh, really a pleasure to be back in a way with Andrew um, to share some of our work um, around Femun B. Um, uh, so I won't go on into a lot of detail after uh, Fumiyaki's amazing talk, um, but just for people who are newer to the seminar series uh, and the field in general, um, Protax are bifunctional molecules that recruit both an E3 ligase and a target protein of interest. Um, this induced proximity facilitates ubiquitination of the target, which is degraded through the proteasome. There are a whole bunch of reasons why this mechanism of action is really exciting. Um, these include uh, the ability to modularly design Protax by switching out targeting ligands, the potency enabled by the catalytic mechanism of action, um, and the potential for really, really exceptional selectivity among closely related proteins. Beyond this, Protax can enable targeting of traditionally undruggable proteins because degradation can disrupt functions that are otherwise really challenging to target, for example, um, scaffolding functions. Even though there are more than 600 E3 ligases in human cells, only a handful of these have been um, used to um, induce degradation. And most degraders are designed to act through, uh, most commonly designed to act through Cerebellon and VHL. Uh, these two have uh, proven to have fairly broad substrate scope, but E3s could have different potential for degrading uh, different targets of interest. And we don't know how many other E3s can be used for targeted protein degradation. Uh, many ubiquitin ligases have either unknown or understudied uh, function. And what we really hope to show you here today uh, is that understanding the mechanisms for E3 ligase regulation can really help enable uh, discovery of E3 recruiters. So today, Andrew and I will be sharing the recent work we've done uh, harnessing the E3 ligase from 1 b for uh, targeted protein degradation. Uh, Andrew's first going to discuss uh, fem one bs role in redox homeostasis and the really amazing work he's done there, along with the discovery of a, a covalent fem one b ligand. And then I'll return to talk about making uh, bifunctional degraders. So all yours, Andrew. All right, uh, so uh, like uh, Nate said, I will be introducing a little bit on Femon-B. And so um, maintaining the cellular redox state uh, is uh, critically important for the homeostasis of the cell. Um, and as many of you know, tilting the scale to a more oxidative environment is deleterious uh, and can cause oxidative stress or too many reactive oxygen species. Uh, which can damage cellular components. Uh, conversely, if the cell is too reductive, this results in the mess, much less understood and studied reductive stress, which is too few reactive oxygen species. And this can arise uh, from decreases in mitochondrial activity or from the overproduction of antioxidants. Uh, and this is detrimental because this can interfere 
uh, with signaling and metabolism through preemptive uh, ROS scavenging. And so in cells, there are three stress responses that control the cellular redox state. Uh, hypoxic stress, stress, or not enough oxygen, uh, is sensed by the ligase called 2 VHL and its transcription or its substrate, the transcription factor HIP1 alpha, uh, that controls blood vessel development. Oxidative stress uh, is sensed by the ligase called 3 keep one uh, and its uh, substrate nerfed to the transcription factor uh, that can boost antioxidant um, uh, production as well as cellular detoxification enzymes. And we recently identified a new pathway that responds to reductive stress. Thumb1b is another uh, column ligase that degrades a critical substrate that we found to be FNIP1, a known metabolic regulator that we and others have shown to play critical roles in mitochondrial activity and energy metabolism, as well as established roles in mTORC1 signaling. Thus, oops, thus upon uh, reductive stress, uh, Thumb1b is activated, this degrades FNIP1, leading to an increase in mitochondrial activity, uh, the main uh, uh, site in the cell for reactive oxygen species production to alleviate reductive stress. And so as an example of how Thumb1B and FNIP1 control mitochondrial function, I'd like, you, uh, I'd like to show some of that supporting data. Here is some electron micrographs of uh, myoblasts focusing on the mitochondria. You can see in control cells or in FNIP1 depleted cells, these nice looking mitochondria uh, with uh, normal looking cristae. However, in Thumb1B depleted cells, the mitochondria are much darker, uh, a phenotype ascribed to lack of substrate for oxidative phosphorylation. Uh, some, display, some mitochondria display this onion-like swirling of the cristae, uh, which is indicative of an upregulation of the respiratory chain components in response to impaired oxidative phosphorylation. Uh, and some of the mitochondria contain these large blebs, indicating ongoing mitophagy. Importantly, co-depletion with the substrate, FNP1, uh, rescues this phenotype. More directly, we can uh, measure readouts of mitochondrial function like respiration using oxygen consumption. So uh, depletion of FEM1B um, uh, uh, leads to a reduction in the oxygen consumption rate, indicating a less active mitochondria. Conversely, activation of FEM1B uh, through this R126Q disease allele uh, uh, leads to an upregulation of the oxygen consumption. And this R126Q allele um, uh, basically relieves an inhibition uh, of these pseudo-substrate inhibitors of FEM1P. Um, in addition, this increase in uh, OCR leads to an increase in ROS. Thus, FEM1B can actually modulate mitochondrial function. And this led us to pursue whether we could actually use FEM1B uh, to tune mitochondrial activity for therapeutic benefit in specific disease contexts. If we inhibit FEM1B, uh, this might be um, uh, a way to treat certain types of cancers. Um, in addition, if we activate FEM1B by removing this inhibition, uh, this may be uh, helpful in uh, uh, relieving mitochondrial dysfunction by overactivating mitochondria. And so we wondered if we could actually target FEM1B with a small molecule. In addition, as FEM1B is a ubiquitin ligase, this work might also provide a potential handle for PROTAC development. And so if we take purified FEM1B with the rest of the column ligase, uh, our substrate FNP1, this is a dilabeled degron of FNP1, and the rest of the ubiquitolation machinery, you can see when we add all three of these together in lane three, we get a very robust ubiquitolation signal. And this uh, generates very large processive change uh, of ubiquitin that would be a uh, robust signal for proteasome targeting of potential selected substrates. Uh, so, uh, to begin this work, though, we have to understand more about the system. And so uh, our working model uh, for this pathway um, is that in uh, reductive stress, a small cysteine patch on FNP1 is reduced, and this is what FEM1B is able to recognize. This leads to the ubiquitolation of FNP1 and subsequent degradation. Degradation of FNP1 leads to an increase in mitochondrial activity that generates ROS to alleviate the reductive stress. However, one major question uh, what, uh, that we had is how does FEM1B actually recognize the cysteine residues? And understanding this, how it recognizes a substrate would be important for developing a strategy to target FEM1B. And so for this, we uh, saw the structure of FEM1B uh, shown in green, as well as the minimal FEM1B interaction domain of FNP1 in orange. Uh, and to our surprise, right at the interface of these uh, two molecules were two zinc atoms. 
<laughs> and looking at this interaction in more detail, we could see that the zincs are co-coordinated by the three cysteines that we knew were important uh, in the degron of FNP1, as well as uh, three residues that are um, uh, from, uh, that FEM1B contributes, these two histidines and the cysteine. Interestingly, the zinc seems to be the primary interaction surface between the degron and FEM1B, acting as a molecular glue to bring uh, the degron and FEM1B together. Uh, and importantly, there's this cysteine residue C186 and FEM1B that seems to be involved in substrate binding. We could test the importance of the cysteine residue in cells using a FEM1B reporter. And so shown in blue is uh, the degron that we crystallized with FEM1B. Uh, we could fuse this to GFP uh, on a bisystronic plasmid that also expresses M-cherry off an internal ribosome entry site. And thus the GFP to M-cherry ratio nicely indicates the stability of this degron and is a great readout for FEM1B activity. Uh, if we express uh, this reporter alone in control cells, uh, this reporter has a relatively high GFP to M cherry ratio. Uh, and upon uh, FEM1B overexpression, the reporter shifts to the left, indicating degradation. And if we express the FEM1B C186S, this degradation is completely blocked, indicating uh, FEM1B can no longer bind to its substrate and ubiquitoid it. In addition, we tested whether the cysteine in FEM1B was important in vitro uh, using a recombinant MDP purified FEM1B and this Tamra labeled FNP1 Degron and measured uh, affinity by fluorescence polarization. And as you can see, wild type FEM1B has a nice binding curve with a KD of around 20 nanomolar. However, C186S is unable to bind FNP1 at all, confirming a key role for this uh, cysteine residue in substrate binding. Uh, and as we had already collaborated with the Nomura lab on other aspects of FEM1B, we set up a new collaboration to see if we could actually target this cysteine residue in FEM1B using our established assays, like the fluorescence polarization assay, uh, with their expertise in developing covalent ligands. And so uh, using a library the Nomura lab assembled, uh, we were able to screen about 600 cysteine reactive com or ligands uh, in a competitive fluorescence polarization assay that I just introduced. And of these, EN106 uh, was one of the only few strong hits and it showed the most significant inhibition. EN106 contains a chloroacetamide handle uh, that is likely targeting a cysteine involved in the FEM1B FNP1 inter interaction. Uh, the IC50 of EN106 in our fluorescence polarization assay was around 2.2 micromolar. And using mass spectrometry based approaches, uh, the Nomura lab was actually uh, able to confirm that EN106 bound to C186 uh, in FEM1B, the system we know is involved uh, for substrate recognition. Importantly, we can use our fluorescent uh, FEM1B reporter to test if EN106 can inhibit FEM1B recognition of FNP1 in vivo. Uh, and as you can see uh, in blue is the DMSO treated when we overexpress FEM1B and the degron, we see a degraded curve. However, when we treat with EN106, this curve shifts to the right, indicating that uh, it is stabilized and FEM1B is um, inhibited. This inhibition is dose dependent, both for the overexpression of FEM1B, so you see a nice dose response, uh, as well as for endogenous FEM1B activity, where this stabilization shown here uh, is similar to what we see with loss of FEM1B with this particular reporter. Uh, now that we know that it works in cells um, and we know that it's targeting FEM1B at the cysteine residue, um, I'm going to uh, uh, bring it over to Nate, who will explain uh, some of the molecules that he designed uh, for the system. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so after we identified EN106 as a FEM1B ligand, we made an outcome probe NJH230 to uh, help confirm FEM1B engagement in cells. Uh, we tested this alkyne probe uh, in the FEM1B FNP1 degron fluorescence polarization assay uh, that Andrew just described, and it actually gained activity slightly uh, compared to EN106. Treating uh, HEC293 T cells with the alkyne probe followed with, uh, by streptavidin enrichment of probe labeled targets uh, confirmed that we were able to engage FEM1B in cells. To get a sense for these compound selectivity, we performed a quantitative proteomics experiment um, following a streptavidin pull down. While NJH230 was, has a number of off targets, um, FEM1B was among the top proteins enriched. Other highly modified um, proteins were not uh, known to be involved in the ubiquitin proteasome system, 
um, suggesting that we might be able to use EN106 as a film and recruiter um, for TPD. To explore whether we could make ProTax that recruit from one b we synthesized several BRD4 degraders uh, based off the Bromo domain inhibitor JQ1. Among studies looking to use novel E3s for degradation, the acetylysine reader BRD4 is commonly used as a, a first test case, partly because the first cerebellum based degraders from the Bradner lab targeted BRD4. Of these compounds um, that we made, both uh, alkyl and PEG linkers connecting EN106 to JQ1 degraded BRD4 to some extent, with average DC50 values around one micromolar, uh, actually showing wide SAR. Um, but NJH1106 with this five carbon linker between the two uh, showed both the most potent and the highest maximal degradation at eight hours. NJH1106 still bound FEM1B uh, in vitro, interfering with binding to the uh, FNP1 degron with similar uh, potency to EN106. Uh, as I described on the last slide, this compound induces BRD4 degradation in hex cells, um, and it has a, a time dependent effect with nearly complete degradation occurring around 10 hours. Um, Beyond hex cells, NJH1106 degrades uh, BRD4 with similar potency in the triple negative breast cancer cell line 231 MFP. We also observed degradation in HAP1 leukemia cells um, of similar potency, uh, showing effectiveness across uh, several cancer cell lines. This is actually not, uh, not super surprising. It makes sense given FEM1B's broad expression across tissue types. We also did a number of rescue experiments to support our hypothesis that uh, BRD4 degradation was occurring through FEM1B recruitment. NJH1106 activity was dependent on the proteasome uh, with bortezomib uh, pretreatment fully rescuing degradation, which you can see here. Pretreatment with a netilation inhibitor also rescued BRD4 degradation, indicating uh, that this degradation was occurring through a colon E3 ligase. In a FEM1B knockout cell line, FEM1, uh, BRD4 degradation was significantly reduced, um, showing uh, dependence of the PROTAC on FEM1B. And finally, co-treatment with a tenfold excess of either JQ1 or EN106 was able to fully rescue degradation. Uh, this competitive rescue uh, indicates that engagement of both sides of the PROTAC uh, with their protein targets is uh, necessary to induce degradation. A non-reactive version of NJH1106 lacking the electrophilic fluoroacetamide uh, was also used as a negative control compound. Not only did this compound fail to uh, disrupt the FEM1B FNP1 interaction in our fluorescent polarization assay, um, but it did not induce BRD4 degradation uh, in cells, demonstrating that covalent engagement of FEM1B is required for these EN106 uh, based um, compounds to induce degradation. We examined the selectivity of our degrader through a TMT based uh, quantitative proteomics experiment, uh, where we observed relatively selective degradation of BRD4. This observed loss of uh, PNMAL1 which is largely uncharacterized, um, was confirmed by Western to be an artifact, leaving us with um, fairly selective BRD4 degradation. Finally, we were able to degrade a second target, uh, BCR able. I'll just show this one compound here, um, but this disatinib based degrader, NJH2142, was able to degrade BCR able and C able uh, to a lesser extent um, at higher concentrations, uh, showing that. FEM1B can be used to degrade targets beyond uh, BRD4. Together, I think this story of FEM1B is a really great example of how understanding the mechanism of E3 ligase function enables the discovery of, of novel E3 recruiters. Uh, we used the discoveries Andrew had made uh, concerning FEM1B's substrate recognition um, to covalently target a reactive cysteine with an electrophilic small molecule, EN106, uh, which we then use to make protax, uh, adding FEM1B to the toolbox of E3s available for targeted protein degradation. The most established, you know, go-to E3 ligase, um, E3 ligases for people interested in making degraders have reversible binding links, most notably uh, 
several on a VHL, um, and also IAP and MDM2. But chemoproteomic techniques and covalent ligand screening have uh, really enabled new E3 ligases to be harnessed for targeted protein degradation quite rapidly. Um, over only the last three years, since 2019, a number of electrophilic molecules have been discovered that recruit a variety of E3s. Uh, these in include uh, RNF-114, RNF-4, DCAF-16, KEEP-1, and DCAF-11. Some of these were discovered uh, here at Berkeley in collaborations between the Nomura and Maimoni groups and others, uh, DCAF-16 and DCAF-11 by Xiaoyu Zhang working uh, with Ben Cravat at Scripps. Discovering that we can use uh, Thermo-1B as well, not only adds a new E3 ligase to this toolbox, uh, but it continues to show the power of using covalent screening platforms to quickly discover new chemical probes. And given the number of E3 ligases that have ligandable cysteines, which is most of them, um, this approach could continue to be useful if there's interest in finding a ligand for a particular E3. One last really exciting idea I'd like to, about Film1B that I'd like to leave you with um, is the potential for the discovery of molecular glue degraders. Cysteine 186 on Film1B sits in this substrate recognition site, as Andrew described. And a zinc mediated molecular, molecular glue mechanism is responsible for degradation of the endogenous substrate FNP1. It seems reasonable uh, in this case that monovalent small molecules like uh, E106 that modulate the surface of this region may be able to recruit neo substrates to FEM1B. Cerebron seems to have quite a broad substrate scope when using bifunctional degraders, but if we'd like to find uh, lower molecular weight, molecular glue degraders that target a wide, wider variety, variety of proteins uh, beyond, say, you know, zinc finger containing proteins. You know, investigating molecules that bind substrate recognition sites on E3s, just like this one, I think would be a particularly promising place to look. So with that, um, I'd like to thank um, I'd like to thank Andrew, who is the most amazing uh, collaborator one could ask for, uh, as well as, as Dan and, and Michael, uh, and a couple other people who worked on this project, including uh, Jessica, um, who kicked it off with Andrew and Erica, as well as several folks at Novartis who we collaborated with. Uh, and I'd like to thank Nate as well, uh, and um, everyone that was involved in the project, uh, Michael, as well as all the Rapa Lab people that have worked on, on Fem1B, which was the background to this, um, and some of our collaborators that helped us set up assays and also helped the crystal structure. Be happy to take any questions.